All right, everyone, welcome to Curious Vlad. This is our first episode, uh, and we invite those who will be watching this on video to join us live every Monday night at 8 o'clock. So the idea is that this will be a kind of a question and answer show where people can ask questions when we're on live together. Um, I'll always prepare a little bit of something that we can talk about ahead of time, uh, and maybe that'll inspire uh, more questions. So we'll get started with that, but first, before anything, we should start with a prayer. O heavenly King, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, who art everywhere present and fillest all things, treasury of good things and giver of life, come and dwell in us and cleanse us of all impurity and save our souls, O good one. All right, well, today is 9-11, uh, and uh, it's the 22nd anniversary of the terrorist actions in America. Uh, and of course, those took place on this day, which is the Feast of St. John the Baptist, the beheading of the Baptist. And we always have a fast day on this day. It doesn't matter what day of the week that it falls, it's always a fast. Uh, and it seems rather appropriate that such with such a, a you know, difficult, almost we may say heinous action that took place, it's kind of a good time for mourning and the fact that we're mourning the beheading of St. John the Baptist with our one-day fast, I, I think that's very good and, and appropriate. Almost 3,000 people died on that day, and I think it's really important that we not forget uh, the real oneness we had as a people uh, after that, and uh, also those who died after the fact because they went to help those uh, who were suffering and dying, the first responders who died from cancer and other things, and are still dying even today. Um, so we should remember them always on this day. And, all, and also, this day is the day of the remembrance of Orthodox soldiers. And most people don't know that uh, for various reasons. Um, let's get in here. For various reasons, um, we, we associate uh, days of memorial with well, our Memorial Day, also with our, uh, around the feast, uh, the remembrance of the day of victory uh, of World War II, and so on and so forth. But we, of course, this is the day that has always been traditional to pray for fallen Orthodox soldiers. And I think that's interesting as well. One other thing I'd like to talk about is the parable that we had yesterday uh, that was read in the church of the of the wedding feast. Really interesting one and very useful one. And for those who didn't get a chance to read it, it's Matthew 22, cha uh, chapter 22, 1 through 14. And it's a very good one, I, I think, and a very useful one for us and reminds us uh, how we have to sort of uh, really throw off the old man that we brought with us when we came to Christ and then put on the new. So it's real, I think, a really useful parable uh, and encourage everybody to read it. That's Matthew 22, 1 to 14. Um, also, an interesting uh, and I think important announcement, and that we want to really get out there, is that 10% of our festival proceeds are going to go to support Ukrainian war refugees. So uh, please let people know that we're putting it all over the place. Um, but you know, it's good for us to remind people. A lot of people have weird misconceptions about our parish. We don't have politics at our parish. Um, we worship God and try to live according to the gospel and that's that. Um, but folks have these odd misconceptions and hopefully this will help them to dispel at least one of those and they'll dispel the rest of them by coming to the festival and joining us. Okay, so uh, that's a little preamble from me. Um, I can go on and on, as you all know, uh, pretty much ad nauseum, but that's not what this is for. Um, so what I think we should do is open it up to some questions now, see if anyone has any prepared questions. If not, well, I'll go on with other thoughts that, that I have that I've prepared just in case there aren't too many questions. Um, so let's see if somebody wants to ask a question. Now, uh, at the bottom of your screen, there's a hand. And if you press it, it shows that you raise your hand. So I'll, I'll know to call upon you, or you can just jump in as you wish. So if anybody would like to ask a question, you can go ahead and do that now. Uh, Helen, I see you've got your hand raised. Yes. Um, would you please clarify the relationship between the prophet Elijah and uh, St. John the Baptist? Um, maybe you could give a little, a little bit more context in that way. Uh, in which way do you mean? That's a, a a broad enough question that I could go off on a real tangent. Um, this idea that people thought that um, St. John the Baptist was Elijah. Uh, oh, yes. Okay, very back. good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so St. John the Baptist, um, everybody knew about Elijah. Right, he was the probably the most famous of the prophets who rode through the heavens 
in a fiery chariot, one of uh, only two or three people in the history of the world who didn't die, but rather was taken straight to heaven. Um, so everyone knew about him. And even almost certainly uh, the Romans also knew about him uh, because he was so, so famous. And so whenever there was any kind of religious revival or, or there were miracles, um, it was very common for people to go to Elijah and think, okay, well, this is this must be Elijah. He's come back. He went up in his chariot and now he's back. And, and uh, you know, he's back to great miracles like when uh, all of the priests uh, of Baal were uh, slain uh, when they had that competition, if you remember, uh, about the... Um, the sacrifices remember he was pouring water over his and so on and so forth and they were dancing around and fire never came down from heaven for theirs but it came and consumed his um these sorts of things so i, I think that's what you're getting at helen and that's why he is often remembered uh he's often thought of as uh the sort of first person that the the romans or even the jews would think about when we're talking about miracles okay thank you you're welcome Okay, so that hand raising worked really good. That's the first time I actually saw that used. I knew it. I knew it existed, but we never tried it before. So, if someone would like to ask a question, uh, please hit the little hand on the bottom of your screen, uh, and I'll hear a little noise, and I'll see that you're raising your hand, and, and I'll call upon you. All right, then you're going to force me to just talk more, and that that's going to make people sad but I, I will I will keep going so um, I thought it would be nice to talk about the importance of the weekday divine services a little bit um, I think that we often we know that they happen uh, but exactly why they happen um, most churches just kind of meet on Sundays uh, and so why are we doing this uh, during the week when we could just do it on Sunday and we could sleep in the rest of the week when we're not working or whatever so I think it's good to understand that the standard sort of standard practice uh, in the Orthodox Church is that liturgy would be served essentially every day, uh, except for some few days, uh, mostly during Great Lent, or like the first day of some of the Lenten periods. Th those also don't have liturgy, but essentially liturgy is served every day in the church. Now in parish churches, that's not always the case. In fact, it's rarely the case. So in cathedrals, and in large monasteries, liturgy is served every day. And so at St. Vladimir's, we're trying to find a kind of happy medium where we're not just serving on Sunday because that really limits the sort of understanding of the church and the divine services. Um, but we're not going to be serving every day, at least not anytime soon. So, but having the opportunity to serve some weekday services, first of all, every time liturgy is served, it benefits everyone in the parish, whether they're there or not. Uh, and so I think we have to keep that in mind. The church is there to serve the divine liturgy. Uh, and the more that we do that, the better it is uh, for all of our parishioners, like I said, whether they're present or not. Um, and everyone is prayed for in the divine services, all the parishioners. So it's something that's very positive from that point of view. It's also, at least for me, I love the weekend services. Um, lots of people, big choir, everything is big and beautiful. Um, but I also really need, I would say, those weekday services when it's quiet and prayerful and there's fewer people. Uh, and maybe everything is sung more simply. Um, but at least for me, that's, that really helps sustain me spiritually. Uh, and I know a lot of people, too, because uh, that's true for a lot of people, too, because a lot of people do come to the services. Um, not as many as on Sunday, but over time, a lot of people participate in the weekday services. So now we're getting into our uh, academic year again, and we'll be having services every Wednesday morning. So Tuesday evening, Wednesday morning. Uh, and beginning October, well, actually beginning September 30th, we'll essentially be serving Friday evenings and Saturday mornings also uh, for, for most of the academic year, if not for the whole year, at least till the Father Dimitri, our new priest, uh, graduates and moves on to his parish assignment. While he's here, we'll probably serve just about every Saturday. And that will give people an opportunity to be in church. Um, and for some folks, they prefer to be in church when it's a, a smaller group. And so it gives them that opportunity too. Um, this also sort of just begs the question, well, what about those evening services? We have the morning services, but what's up with that? There's a liturgical day and it begins at sunset. It has nine divine services in it. Um, 
some of those are the hours like the third and sixth hour that is read vespers matins first hour compline midnight office and divine liturgy all of those are services that go in the liturgical day and so it's traditional if we're going to especially if we're going to commune uh on uh in the morning if we can participate in the evening services now if we live real far away that's not practical and that's not going to happen but if we live relatively close that's kind of the ideal uh and it's it's interesting um talking with one of the i would say foremost liturgists so someone who studies liturgy and the services uh in the world we were having a conversation about this and his argument is that the most important part preparing ourselves for divine uh, for partaking of holy communion is being at the preparatory divine services vespers and matins it's an interesting idea we all think about the uh the prayer rule that, that uh, is before partaking of holy communion and that is important but his argument is that the most important part is to be at the services so i think that's pretty interesting we broadcast the services so that if, if you can't be there uh, in person you can always participate on our uh, audio stream. We got rid of the video stream. That was something that the bishop really didn't like and he saw it as something temporary uh, for the pandemic. And, and when President Biden said the pandemic is over, then that was that. We, we got we got rid of our, our video stream. Um, and so we still have our uh, audio stream, which I think is pretty good. And if you can't be there for the services, you can always join them. So anyway, maybe now that I've said a little something about uh, weekday divine services, uh, someone will have a question about that, or maybe it inspired another question. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. Yeah, I see Grisha is coming in and will appear momentarily, and there he is. Welcome, Grisha. We we're just talking about uh, the weekday divine services and uh, how the evening services and the, the uh, divine liturgy relate. Um, if you would like to ask a question, there's a little hand at the bottom of your uh, at the bottom of your screen, you can click on that and it'll let us know that you want to ask a question. Mark has raised his hand, so let's let Mark ask his question. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious about the evening services uh, or the, the, the liturgical cycle in a parish, um, how it's, uh, I mean, I know that there are a lot of, there we do normally the vigil matins or vespers and matins and uh, and the first hour, um, but I know there are other s services also, you know, Compline and um, and uh, the Midnight Office you mentioned. Um, can I, how how is it determined? I guess that we just we just stop with the vigil and first hour, and you know, and those those other services aren't normally incorporated. I guess I guess how how is that decision made, or what's the uh, yeah, so no, that's a really good. That. That's a that's a really good question. So, uh, so that folks understand the question that Mark is asking, we talked about the fact that there's nine divine services that make up a liturgical day, uh, but we don't there aren't we don't serve all of those necessarily in the parish. So, we get the practice of the divine services as we use them now from the monastic practices. Um, essentially, at some point. The practices that were used in the monasteries were written down. The sort of most famous uh, compilation is the Tipicon of St. Saba from just outside Jerusalem. It's called the Jerusalem Tipicon. In any case, um, this sort of tells us what services to serve, how to serve them. Actually, it's a really interesting book. Unfortunately, it's not all translated into English. It tells you how to light a lamp. It tells you how to eat lunch together with the brethren. It's, re it's really very interesting how it, it goes in great detail uh, into what's happening in, in the monastic life. Well, in the parish life, it became the practice to not follow all of those services. Um, specifically, the ones that are generally left out are compline and midnight office. Now, in the Russian church, we have the longstanding practice, maybe, maybe it's four or 500 years uh something like that where on saturday nights we serve what's called a resurrectional vigil right it doesn't matter if the service is uh, of a high rank a low rank it just doesn't matter whatever it is we serve a vigil that's not true the whole rest of the week vigil is a rank it's a very high rank of the service like saint nicholas the wonder worker is a vigil rank feast saint vladimir is a vigil rank feast like the really 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 big saints um but of course they don't always fall on sunday uh and so 
that became the practice of the Russian church. An interesting uh, side note to that is that in uh, the countryside, not in the city, but in the countryside where most people lived in an agricultural society, Saturday vigil was at 3 p.m. Anyone care to guess why it was at 3 p.m.? It has to do with the schedule of milking cows so that you could go to vigil, you could do your morning chores, you could go to vigil, uh, you could get home, milk the cows, uh, have a meal, and get to sleep. So you could wake up and milk the cows before church the next day. Very interesting. And even to this day, that's often practiced. I mean, we, we follow more of the city practice where we have ours at 6 o'clock. In any case, um, this is the Saturday evening vigil. But even weekday services, um, the Compline and Midnight Office are really considered to be monastic services. And each of these services is done at a certain time of day. Midnight office, not surprisingly, is to be done at midnight, uh, and so on and so forth. So in a parish practice, that's even in a village, even in an agricultural situation where the church is really like the center of everything that's going on, it's still not really practical in family life uh, to have all of these services separated, a bunch of short services throughout the day. So uh, it became the practice uh, in the Russian church, even on a weekday, to serve uh, vespers and matins in the evening. Occasionally you might serve uh, matins in the morning before liturgy, but but very rarely. Again, you have to do your chores before you get to church. So all of these things had to be taken into account. And over time, Compline and Midnight Office just kind of fell out of usage in parishes. I hope that answers the question, Mark. Yes, yes, thank you. Good. Excellent. Okay, so if anyone else has a question, please feel free to ask it. You can raise your hand or you can just jump in and make some noise. Okay, then I am going to talk about singing together in church. So there are certain times when we sing together in church. The, the times that that's most kind of encouraged and that we, we really try to do that, uh, and Vladika really feels strongly about that, uh, is at vigil on Saturday night, having beheld the resurrection of Christ, which is sung right after the resurrectional gospel. There's a cycle of 11 resurrectional gospels that are read over the course of 11 weeks, and that, that just repeats throughout the year, and then it resets after Pascha. Um, so because Pascha is a moving target, you know, you're going to start then, but you might end with the seventh one before we have to do it again, right? Because it's it, Pascha moves, so it might be earlier or later. In any case, um, having beheld the resurrection of Christ is sung after the Sunday resurrectional gospel during Pentecost, which is that time from Pascha to Pentecost. That whole period is called Pentecost. During that time, we sing it three times. Um, and uh, I have very fond uh, recollections of being a young deacon in Jordanville uh, during, I was ordained on St. George, so it was during Pentecost uh, that year. Uh, and probably it was the first Saturday vigil, if I know Father Roman, who was the choir director. Um, it's the youngest uh, deacon who holds the gospel after uh, after the reading, after the bishop reads it in the middle of the church, the youngest deacon goes up on the ambo and holds the gospel. Well, in Jordanville, after Pascha, uh, on Pascha and during Pentecost, we had this massive brass gospel, just massive. It must have been like, I don't know, about the size of half of my height. So it's like two and a half feet high, a little bit more, almost three, not three. But anyway, it was big, huge, heavy. Uh, and so I come up there and the choir sings so slowly. <laughs> Having beheld the res, And I know there were two more after this. So I'm just dying up there. I'm dying up there. And then, but then Father Roman really hit the gas for the other two. But he he got a good chuckle out of that, and probably everybody else in the church did too. And I actually thought that was kind of funny. Um, so anyway, there there is uh, there is levity in the church for sure. Um, so anyway, this is uh, this is the the cycle of the eleven resurrectional gospels, uh, and this is one of the things that we sing together is having beheld the resurrection of Christ. Then the other two things are the creed which is good for us to memorize. And really, if we sing it every Sunday, we will memorize it. Ideally, we memorize it before we even come into the church because this is like our our fight song. This is our 
this is the this is what we believe in this is the core of our beliefs uh and if anybody ever asks you what do you what do you believe as an orthodox christian i think it's better best to just read the creed i mean just start saying the creed i believe in one god father almighty maker of heaven and earth and so on and so forth and that that concisely tells us uh, and tells everyone what we believe so we sing that on on sundays and on feast days whenever there's enough people in church to sing even on a weekday mostly people sing it together uh and then our father uh, our father and i know that archbishop peter would want me to tell you that on weekdays uh there are some instructions you can find that say on weekdays you make a prostration uh at our father but saint john of shanghai in san francisco always said no 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 we don't do that because we are entreating god as his children as his son and a son doesn't prostrate before the father a slave does so that's interesting little piece that in our diocese we don't do a prostration then um in any case those are the three things that we sing always all together uh and if you haven't um had the opportunity to learn those things you can find them on our website we post it on the home page uh periodically uh usually about once a month uh the links to those those songs so that you can practice them uh at home but if you're giving it a good try on sunday mornings it won't take too long and you'll you'll know it pretty well okay so that's singing together in church anyone have questions about that or maybe that motivated a question from you um you might know that in um in um google meet you can message there's a messaging feature it's on the right hand side of your screen um so here is the messaging feature so now everybody can see that uh, and you could also ask a question there if you're a little too shy uh, to make noise uh, here on the on the broadcast, or if you can't figure out how to unmute uh, your yourself, you could also do it uh, there. So please take advantage of that uh, and ask a question if you'd like to do that. Okay. Another thing that we could talk about um is what time to get to church people often often ask what what time should i get to church there's an interesting instruction from one of the aptina elders aptina is a monastery which is opened again now i suppose during the soviet time and they had a tradition there of eldership um where they sort of you explain that like it was a sort of very strict monastic life, which for whatever reason in that place often led to the uh, spiritual fathers being rather clairvoyant. Um, so in any case, one of the fathers, and I can't remember which one it is, but I'll, I'll look it up. Um, he used to say that it's better to come early, sorry, it's better to come late and stay to the end than to come early and leave early. I've always found that interesting, that it's important to stay to the end. But I would also argue that it's important to come early. Uh, ideally, we want to kind of uh, arrange our candles and prospera and so on and so forth, all of those things that we need to do, the, the sort of business part of coming to church before, uh, before the divine liturgy begins uh, and be in our place so that we're ready when it does. So that means that we need to get there you know, between 9.30 and 10 o'clock. And of course, if we want to come to confession, uh, if we live far away and we've made an appointment, then we come, you know, sometime early so that we can do that. Um, so in any case, it's good to be there earlier rather than later. Of course, those with kids have to come late. That's understood. Uh, and so you come late and stay to the end. That, that to me, I always found that very interesting, that it's more important uh, to, to stay to the end than anything else. Okay. Um, so Diane asked a question. Is there an order from when asking a blessing from priests at church? Like if there are multiple priests together, who do you approach? Yeah, I mean, there are, there is. Um, so first things first, on, on the rare time when the bishop is visiting, um, the priest won't give you a blessing because the priests get their blessing from the bishop, right? I mean, the, our, our, the grace of the priesthood comes from the bishop. So when the bishop is present, the priest doesn't bless you. You get a blessing from the bishop. Um, but let's say that there's the three of us uh, priests 
for some reason you you run into us we're talking you want to get a blessing so you'd ask the senior priest first and then the next senior priest and then the the last senior priest so it goes in order of seniority but it's not that big of a deal nobody's gonna you know yell at you or something like that but that's that's officially how we would do it start with the senior and move towards the junior um that's true too if you end up with a gaggle of bishops again that doesn't happen too often but like when politica had his 20th anniversary this summer i think we had seven bishops there seven or eight bishops something like that so you know that that was a thing uh if you have the opportunity you kind of get a blessing from them in the order of their seniority senior first down to junior but again it's not that big of a deal good to know but not to worry about okay good so danny used the the uh the notes feature and even said thank you you're welcome uh that's a really cool way to ask a question here uh and now whether people will see that on the recording that i don't know we'll have to see we'll have to see but um in any case i'll repeat whatever you write there as long as it's you know repeatable uh and then uh, they'll at least hear what the question is that you're asking good anybody else have questions that they'd like to ask you can always submit a question ahead of time if you want to. You can send me an email or a text. Um, but in any case, if you'd like to ask a question, please do that. Um, yeah, when to do prostrations in church? This is a question that people often ask. When to do prostrations in church? Um, and I do post that also on the home page on some kind of regular basis. Um, essentially, on Sundays, we don't do prostrations in church. And therefore, most of the time, most of us don't do prostrations in church. And we think that, therefore, doing prostrations in church is weird and like not something that is normally done. But it's actually the opposite. It's actually the opposite. For six days of the week, we do prostrations in the church at certain times of the service. Uh, and even when we come into the church, sometimes, if it's a very simple day, uh, whereas only one day of the week, but the day of the week when we all go to church on Sunday, we don't do prostrations because we're celebrating the resurrection. It's all about rising. It's all about the resurrection. So there's no, interestingly, there are no prostrations allowed in church on Sunday. Um, there are a couple of exceptions. The cross holiday, if it falls on a Sunday, um, always the cross holiday on the third Sunday of Great Lent, which will be Annunciation this year, actually. That's going to be a very interesting service. Um, Annunciation is the midway point of Great Lent. And Pascha is May 5th. Um, and on Pentecost, we do prostrations in the church. It's Sunday on the calendar, but it's already liturgically Monday because that's the Vesper service. So essentially, you don't really do prostrations in church on Sunday, but you do most of the other days of the week. Uh, and so it seems weird to us, but it's actually the norm. Um, and so when you get a chance, uh, look on the website. I'll try to put that up this week um, because we haven't had it up probably for about a month or maybe even more. I'll put it up and, and you can have a look there. Um, okay, so the question is, um, I've always wondered why the number of communicants and the number that kiss the cross are counted. Um, it's just a metric that we use in the diocese. So we, we have a consistent metric that we use in every single parish. Um, the number of people who kiss the cross, that's essentially a surrogate for just how many people are in the church. We know that that doesn't capture everybody. Somebody has to run to the kitchen. Somebody doesn't come up to the cross because maybe they're new and they don't know what to do or they're afraid or something like that. And the number of people who are partaking of Holy Communion, that gives us a good feel for how many people are really like living a sacramental life, really striving for the kingdom. Uh, and it's something that we can track over time and it's something we can track across the diocese. So that's why it's just, those are metrics. There's nothing magic about those metrics. Um, but those are questions, those are metrics that we can track consistently. And so it helps us to kind of have a feel for what's happening in the diocese. Uh, Grisha, I see that you raised your hand. So you're muted. So you're, you, you want to click the microphone. There you go. Go ahead. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Sure. So I had a quick question about um, the way that we view Christ's like sacrifice on the cross. And if we like, I know that can be like a contentious issue, how you describe it, I think, between Protestants and um, like the apostolic churches. Um, is it correct to say that he paid the debt for our sin? Or is there a better way to say that? 
So there's a really interesting book uh, called The Dogma of Redemption by Metropolitan Anthony Kravitsky. Actually, I should get that book for the, for the kiosk. It's not big. It's not thick. Uh, it, it's an excerpt from Metropolitan Anthony's five volumes, which is a huge amount of writing that he did. Um, and it really, I think, captures beautifully the orthodox understanding of Christ's sacrifice uh, on the cross. The whole, the entire point of this is that Christ takes on our sins uh, when he ascends the cross. And we can see the, how even for God, this is shocking and even repulsive. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prays, you know, Father, if you to take this chalice away, this cup away from me, not as I will, but as you will. Like this is, this is a this is a major major point uh, of the entire process of his crucifixion. And Metropolitan Anthony argues that really this is where already our redemption begins, is when the Lord agrees in prayer to his Father that he will take upon all of these all these sins upon the cross, and he ascends the cross uh, and is and died of course for i'm living glory in the call here sorry and um was cru crucified and died for our sake the issue that we find in the western uh churches is that there's sort of this idea that christ is the only sacrifice that the father would accept like that a father wants his child to be his sacrifice or killed like that the father is mad because of the sins of mankind and only killing his own son can can make him his bloodlust kind of fulfilled it just doesn't make any sense it just doesn't make any sense when you start to, to think about it in those terms and those are the terms that are actually used people just don't pay attention to it people just don't pay attention to it but the the terms that are used are very very much just don't make any sense Whereas if we as Orthodox Christians understand this is an act of love that the Lord took upon, took these sins upon himself, not to satisfy the Father's, you know, need for a sacrifice, but he voluntarily sacrificed himself so that we would have the opportunity uh, to overcome sin, to, to attain the heavenly kingdom. So for the Orthodox, the idea is, is all about God's love for mankind, not about uh, God's wrath uh, towards mankind because of man's sin. Is that helpful? I mean, does that kind of get to what you were thinking about, Christian? Yeah, yeah, thank you. I just um, wanted to make sure that that, that language is, is correct to use. I've, I was reading um, St. Athanasius uh, in his um, on the Incarnation, and he describes yes. it as a debt paid. And I just wanted to make sure that that is the correct language. So I, I just didn't want to be, you know, talking about it and be maybe misunderstood of having like a non-orthodox understanding of it. Yeah, I, I think that that's that's good. We're gonna we're gonna say that Saint Athanasius knows what he's saying, uh, and that the translator was able to convey that correctly. I would encourage everybody, and I will order some of those um, dogma of redemption. I would encourage everybody to read it. It's a beautiful, beautiful explanation of what's happening uh, in the crucifixion in a in a really orthodox way. So. Anyway, I, I think it's really super, and I'll I'll get some copies for the uh, for the kiosk. Okay, thank you very much. Good. You're welcome. That's a great question. Uh, other folks have questions. You can raise your hands by pressing the hand at the bottom of the of the screen, or you can just unmute yourself and ask. So I see Lori joined us, and Lori, welcome. Um, We've talked about several things tonight, and as I mentioned, uh, this is recorded, so it'll be up on our YouTube channel. Um, how quickly? That we'll have to see. This is going to be our experiment to see how easy it is to to get it up there uh, after we've recorded it on Google Meet. But God willing, uh, it will not take too too long. All right, uh, Grisha, you are raised your hand again, please. Uh, thank you. Um... I don't mean for this to get too theological. So if it needs to like a larger explanation, I, it's okay if you have something short, but you reminded me of something that I've um, wondered about, but never fully, I guess, taken the time to understand. And that is the, the like Christ's um, 
like his wills according to his nature is it true that he has two wills or is he has one will well okay so this is this is a really deep theological uh argument and I, not argument but discussion um so i'm trying to think about who is the best probably of the fathers to to read about this probably it's saint maximus the confessor because this was a big issue uh during his time and in fact the entire east was in heresy uh and only the west the western part of christendom uh w was w maintained the orthodox faith um so probably we won't get too too far in, into the weeds there i would just say for those who'd like to learn more um let me know that and i can uh get some saint maximus the confessor uh out there but the the, the main issue uh is that right the the monothelite heresy one will well it's a heresy so you know that that can't be right um but like god jesus christ is completely god and completely man and so he is completely god and completely man um so that usually helps us to answer at least that always helps me to answer uh those questions another really good book that i think everybody should have uh on their uh, on their bookshelf is called dogmatic theology by father michael pomazansky and 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 it's not that you need to have a ton of theological books but that is a really good one because it's written very concisely it's not hard to read and it has great indices so it also has a really comprehensive comprehensive table of contents so you can like the table of contents is pages long because it's got all of these details about what he's writing there so you can really get to what you want to find out about the faith um we do often have that in the kiosk i don't know if we do now um but that is a really really good book um it was translated actually by father seraphim rose um, so I think that's that's something that I would recommend to everybody to have. Law of God is great, um, but if you want to kind of take that next step into theological understanding, um, then I would say Dogmatic Theology by Father Michael Pomazansky is probably the best book in English. Um, and it's not huge. It's not super expensive. I think it's under 20 bucks on Amazon. Maybe it's a little above now with inflation, but uh, anyway, it's it's a good book to have. Yeah, thank you. I, I I knew about the the monophysites, but I, I guess the monothelites is something I should also know about as well. I was I was wondering if I was maybe confusing those two things, but um, thank you. And, well, and as it pertains to um, what you were talking about before, when you were answering my previous question, so in the Garden of Gethsemane, um, it was Christ. What's, what's the word? Um, praying to the Father that this cup should pass from him. That's with his human will. While it would have, his divine will would have been, you know, understanding the Father and, and how right. you call and it that. wasn't also what's interesting about that episode is it wasn't a surprise to him. This was not something that he's like, oh, that's going to happen. No, that from the time before the creation of the world, all of this was known. God, God is omniscient. He knows everything that has happened, is happening, and will happen. Uh, for God, there just is. There's no even past tense or, or future tense, we can say. Uh, and so that wasn't a surprise. But yes, the, the human, uh, Jesus Christ being completely God and completely man, there are times when his human part shines through, like when the weeping for Lazarus, who had died. He knew Lazarus was going to be resurrected in just a few moments. He knew that Lazarus was going to attain the heavenly kingdom. So it's it's important for us to understand that um sometimes christ's human side shines out a little bit more and it's one of those instances good question thank you good questions yeah saint maximus confessor very interesting life very important i would say to to learn about a lot of times people look at his theology and it just looks so hard to overcome just read his life just read the life of Saint Maximus. That that's all I, I would do. Now there's a, a a book that's just been translated into English called The Life of the Virgin Mary by Saint Maximus. I haven't tackled it yet, uh, but it's on my bookshelf, and I'm looking forward to to reading it. He's one of the most important, I would say, theologians in the history of the Church. Um, but just reading his life alone, I think, would be really really interesting. Maximus. Put in the in the written part of the uh, 
the in-call messages is what they call them. Okay, good. Other questions that anyone has on their mind? Um, I, this kind of a, a get together, a lot of times you don't come with anything, but then it pops into your mind. You're like, oh, that was interesting what Grisha asked. Maybe I, I'm thinking about uh, something along the same lines. Or that it made me think of something that I had been uh, struggling with. Something that uh, actually one of our priests asked me to talk about is how the school relates to the parish. Uh, and I think that's a good question. Like we talked about financials yesterday. Uh, for those who weren't there, we had our quarterly uh, financial question and answer period. And you see funds being moved between the church and the school so that the school is being built and so on and so forth. I think it's important to understand the school is a parish school. So just like in the Roman Catholic Church, they have parochial schools. That's the way the school is set up also in, in our parish, where it's part of the parish. It's not some independent thing that's off on the side that doesn't, it's not part of our parish life. It's an integral part of our parish life. Uh, and I, yeah, I mean, I hope that uh, our society will, will start kind of getting back to normalcy a little bit more. But if we keep going down the road of, of craziness, uh, especially as regards public education, um, the school is going to be more and more important for us because it's going to be so difficult for us to have our kids in public education. And this is coming from someone who had an amazing public education. I had an amazing public education. I, I wouldn't change any of it for the world, but it's everything is different now. Um, and so uh, it, life is different, and therefore the church has to react to the reality that it finds. Uh, and having the opportunity to educate our children and the next generation of leaders for the church uh, is really important for us. And so we, we thought that that was important. That's why we came to the parish and said, hey, let's build this school before we build uh, before we build a, a church. And uh, the parish voted to do that. And I'm very thankful for it. So um, there's this great saying from um, St. Dorotheos of Gaza. And I am going to put that in the chat because it's just so, so good. Uh, and so I think on point for the school, because of course we've had lots of struggles with that. Um, but that is really par for the course uh, when we're talking about spiritual things. Right? St. Dorotheos uh, essentially says, uh, you know, if. If a man is doing something according to God, trial of some kind will come upon him. For trial and temptation either proceed or follow all good. Neither is it sure that the thing is happening according to God, unless it is proved so by trials and temptations. So that's going into the chat right now. Uh, I think that's one of the most important quotes for us living in our days, because somehow we've gotten this idea that, well, if everything isn't smooth and easy, then it must be, it must be bad. It's the other way around, actually, for an Orthodox Christian. For us, if there's absolutely no resistance, we should be thinking, hmm, maybe this isn't really pleasing to God. So anyway, have a look at that. That's a quote that I send uh, as the secretary of the diocese. I probably send that to one of our priests at least once a week. Because, of course, we all have our struggles. Uh, and sometimes it's helpful to remember that the struggle is showing that this is according to, to God's will. And so we've had some struggle with the school. Uh, the cost has essentially doubled since we started, but we have the money to finish it, and we're wrapping everything up here. God willing, will be done by January. Good. Other questions? I thought I heard somebody. Oh, that maybe that's Helen's cat. Does the cat have a question? I hope not. Okay. Last call for questions, and then I think we're going to call it a night because I won't I won't torture you endless endlessly. But I, I do think that that piece about the school is important for us to understand that the school is an integral part of the parish. Uh, and it, it really, going forward, I think we're going to see how important it is. When the Metropolitan came, he said to, to Irene and I, uh, we were we were talking as we were going to the school, and he just said to us essentially, this is so important. You cannot stop. You've got to keep working. You've got to have a place uh, where you can educate your children. Uh, and he was very, very strong about that. And I think that was good for us to hear. Not that we weren't planning to keep going, but sometimes it's good to, to hear that from your leaders. Okay, any other questions before we leave? 
it's about 10 minutes to nine that's a good session we had uh, for our first session we're going to keep trying to do this every week if you have questions you can send them ahead you can put them in the chat uh, you can ask them when you get here uh, and some people will see this on youtube afterwards um, feel free in the comments section to leave a question uh, for next week and we'll be sure to address it so since that looks like we're done brothers and sisters let's pray and we'll say good night it is truly me to bless thee that theotokos ever blessed and most blameless and mother of our god more honorable than the cherubim and beyond compare more glorious than the seraphim who without corruption gave us birth to god the word the very theotokos they do we magnify thanks everybody appreciate you joining us uh and be happy to have feedback uh about how we did tonight so we can make it even better next time good night